So, uh, yeah, so my name is Dmitry Vinnik, and today we will talk about Gaussian Tycho. Um, in other, we will basically discuss behavior driven development and how it's applied to testing and see how this new combination of the tools might assist you in this pursuit. All right, so uh, first and foremost, I always like to establish the goals for any talks I give so you can make a conscious choice whether this session worth your time or you might choose any of the great talks that are happening in parallel with mine. So first and foremost, uh, we will be discussing the behavioral driven development in a nutshell, obviously, for time's sake, but I'll touch on some basics and uh, differences as it apply to Gauch and Taiko and to other frameworks out there. And of course, we'll be focusing on some of the Java aspects of it, uh, as well as the JavaScript, but I'll touch on that in a moment. Uh, then we will discuss, obviously, the Gauch um, in relations to Cucumber. It's one of the most popular behavior-driven frameworks, especially for Java um, ecosystem. And uh, last but not least would be, obviously, touching bases on the Gauch as well as Tyco and where does Tyco help you to automate your um, product testing. So, first it's important to set the context for the, the talk. Basically, what are we going to test today? Because there will be some short demos, but still some demos. So I want to establish the context. I'm not being fancy here. I basically have this... Oh, interesting. I have to press escape before I can do that. Huh, that's cool. Yeah, okay, cool. Now it follows me. So uh, I won't be fancy. As anyone who's ever showing or demoing anything testing related, I will be using to do mvc.com. I have a, a copy of this website running on my Oracle Cloud as a backup. Fortunately enough, this website is up, so I'll be using this for the demos today. Ultimately, this website demonstrates um, usage of different UI frameworks uh, to the just the simplest app, app ever existed to do application. The only one thing I don't like about it is lack of contrast, but bear with me here. So basically, if we... Let me hide my plugins. So uh, it basically, you can create a to-do item. For example, let's speak at the conference and then go to after party, of course, because that's important. Um, when, when you basically have those to-do items, you can complete them, you can delete them, and basically simple operations. Nothing special here. Uh, that's basically the application we'll be focusing on today and uh, apply some of the practices we'll be discussing um, in relations to this website on this web app. Okay, so with this kind of boring talk out of the way, let me get back to my... Awesome. All right, yeah. So you know, with established context, um, we have obviously a question, what do we do now? Now we actually dive into the behavioral driven development, or BDD for sh in short. When it comes to behavioral driven development, obviously, I'm, I'm sure you all heard of some aspects of it, or at least some of you probably even tried it, gave up on it after a while because it pr promised so much but delivers so little for so many teams. And the reason why there is that mismatch and disappointment in the BDD practice as a whole is because people missing out on this definition. I know it's a lot of text, I hate lots of text on my slides, but in short, what Dan Norse tried to highlight here is it's not about really testing or the output of your project, it's about the collaboration. The BDD, the role of behavioral driven methodology and the frameworks that you might use is about facilitating your discussions while you're developing the feature, while you're deploying it and releasing it into the world, not to create regression suites for your um, you know, automation frameworks. So it's not, but th that, that's where the disappointment reside, where we're really focusing on trying to automate our application, especially when it's already done, or legacy system of some sort. We try to automate it with BDD, hoping for some unknown benefit of showing our uh, feature files to the sales or business people. That never happens. So basically, this kind of a disconnect between understanding the collaboration is a key, rather than the uh, testing is what really makes people fail often and why we, what we try to highlight today and hopefully get you on the right path. So with BDD, there are really a couple of highlights I want to make. Again, it's not about testing. You're not trying to create another regression suite for your product. It's about collaboration. It's to assist you while you're developing an application. It's to not to have this disconnect between a list of requirements and the end result, an end production level application. To basically remove this, this uh, misalignment between the stakeholders, using BDD tools to have some automation, some code running that uh, illustrates or really represents the requirements you as a team discuss. It acts as a documentation because as developers, we're really 
talk code. Code is another language, the same way English would be a language to communicate. We use code to talk to our team members, to our peers, to other stakeholders. And the BDD tools do a great job on that. And uh, ultimately, again, it's all about the ubiquitous contact, uh, language to basically remove these borders, those bottlenecks between different stakeholders. And of course, BDD takes quite a bit from the test-driven development, or in short, TDD. So let me really quickly talk about those in a bit more uh, details. Not much, but still. The collaboration, in terms of collaboration, of course, what we have to talk about, something called specification, by example, or some people call it specification workshops, three amigos meetings. But ultimately, what it comes down to is to have all the main stakeholders in your team, whether it's the main experts, developers, testers, everyone in the room, and really talk through the implementation detail. And the BDD tools help you to really out, like, represent those uh, requirements in the real code potential will be running in production. So that's what basically specification workshop in a nutshell might look like. In terms of documentation, again, what's the most common way to document our software? We hate writing documentation, especially maintaining it. It might be fine to write it once, but to update it, or even updating Java docs, the comments is a nightmare on its own. It's the regression tests that often are used as a way to document. If someone asks you, how does this feature work? You say, take a look at the test that's running against this production application. They'll tell you how it works. Does it take null arguments? Let's take a look at the tests. Or does it take like negative values? Let's look at the test. That's where we usually end up in search of the actual behavior that our application has in production. But for the regression tests that we use often uh, implement, the main purpose of those tests is to have the documentation of historical state, to make sure that we do not regress our application when making changes to other parts of the system, or making sure that it hasn't changed, or maybe it's changed through the you know, life cycle of this application. So that's the purpose of regression tests. PDT tests are different. They are not about the historical state, they are about the current state. It's the state that you, as a team, during your specification meetings are discussing and trying to implement. You see how it looks like, or gonna look like, in production. So there is a really, like, you have to have a very strict separation between the two. You're not writing BDD tests to have regression suite running against your um, application, some continuous integration server for years to come. It's about the current state. In terms of ubiquitous language, this concept is obviously taken from domain-driven design idea, where really what's behind this phrase is to be able to speak the same language. In another way, it's the removing this gap between people, uh, stakeholders like engineers and testers. You should have a very direct pipeline, pipeline of communication. It should go both ways. And this is where BDD tests often assist you. You should have the main experts to play a major role in this communication. It might be business people, it might be end customers, or whoever actually uses your software or understands uh, where this software should reside and should be applied to. And the last part I want to mention is obviously the fact that it still takes some aspect of test-driven development. In particular, the point of uh, the test-driven development implies building software by writing tests. It might be a convoluted statement, but in simple terms, in the simplest term possible, it's not about having a feature and then automating it, or basically writing test automation. It's not about that. Instead, it's about writing those tests to write features. Or again, it's going back to this idea of specification workshops where you sit down, you try to make those imp uh, requirements work in some as aspect by writing the feature files, writing the test scenarios, using BDD tools, and then implementing features on top of it. So that's a, just the core idea. But it's been quite a bit of theory. In theory, let's be honest, sometimes can get re very boring. Let's actually look at BDD in practice. So when it comes to BDD, Drink some water. Oh, so good. <laughs> so, the BDD in practice, it's again, it's really about changing the testing paradigm in a sense that it's the same old principles, but just they named a different way. So, in regular testing, just a simple assertion testing, there are three main aspects. It's the you arrange your test data, you act on that data, and then you assert that data. Basically, three A's. 
most of the tests that you write, or regular tests that you write, will follow this pattern. As, you know, set up the data, test it, then make sure it matches the condition you set up. In terms of BDD tools, it follows the same three principles, but just called a bit differently. It's given statement, basically the arrange step. It's when, or basically the act, or execution of the condition of some sort. And the assertion is called then, or what do we expect to happen then, or after uh, we execute this piece of code and the thing that we're trying to test. Nothing special. Again, we're trying to build on top of what you already know. And that's usually the best way to learn anything. It's to based on whatever you already have foundation in. But how do we apply behavioral driven development when it comes to Java ecosystem especially, or Ruby or a bunch of other languages and other ecosystems? Of course, Cucumber comes to mind. Cucumber is a great framework, a great test framework in a sense. I wouldn't even call it a test framework. That's an important uh, separation. It's actually a combination of these three aspects. It acts as automated tests. It's that thing about executed specifications or basically focusing on specifications by example, the specification workshop, and also work as a living documentation or playing that role of testing that enforces or follows the current state of the behavior your customer has to interact with. So that's what the Cucumber is in a nutshell. But you know, overall, when it comes to Cucumber and writing Cucumber tests, what you have is so-called feature file, where you find this you know, often English, but you can use other languages. But basically, you define the steps, or those basic given, when, and then statements, or scenarios. Uh, and then, obviously, there is implementation, because, uh, you know, as unfortunate as it is, that plain uh, language cannot actually translate to the code automatically, as much as we wanted to. Uh, you have to write some implementation bindings that will perform the execution for you. So let's give a take. Let's uh, take a quick, a closer look at that. All right, so actually, before I do that, one more thing, I want to, two more slides I want to show. Um, it's important to obviously, as any consultant would ever say, it depends. So in the case of this scenario for BDD and using Cucumber, let's look at the first special case we'll be discussing today. We have a backend written in Java, and we will have a testing for Cucumber written in Java as well. So let's take a quick look at that. All right, this is it. Right, cool. I don't think we need this part. Right. So, um, in terms of the feature files, we have basically that feature files. We have the defined feature. We have a name for the feature we're trying to test. Um, basically, having the valid to do items. By the way, horrible naming. What the heck does valid even means? Naming things is hard. That being said, you have to name your feature that you're trying to test, and you can leave a small comment. Again, for description purposes. And then you define the scenario or a test case you're trying to automate. So the first scenario is basically that new to-do item can be created. And that's uh, how you potentially your stories or your requirements might look like. You know, I should be able to create um, to-do item. I should be able to change its state. I should be able to delete it. Um, it only should accept special characters or no special characters whatsoever. All those requirements or discussions you have with your teammates, what would ultimately end up in this file, and what you would potentially discuss with all stakeholders, potentially non-developers as well. So this is how it will look like. You have your given uh, you know, clause, or basically arranging of the data, given the to-do name is speak at conference, when I press basically the execution of some sort, or changing of the state, and then allows me to focus on assertion or validating the conditions we have set. In other terms, after I enter the name of the to-do item, I press enter, it should create a new to-do item that uh, is the name uh, that I specified. When I create, obviously, these feature files, as I've said before, there has to be implementation, and implementation, of course, it has a bunch of import statements. But that being said, um, I will potentially have a web driver set up, set up a teardown, nothing special here. Uh, you have a given annotation that marks to the to-do name and then the string clause, a uh, string argument. In other words, you can specify whatever value you want in the feature file. It will be accepted here as an argument in this test method. And then you perform some, some you know, in this case, you find an element on your web page. You set the name, you press enter, and so on and so forth. So nothing special here. And this is not really a talk about how do you write Cucumber test. It's just to show you, this is how the bindings look like. So that's for Java. But 
you know, it's all good and all. All right. The most the important question to ask here is, is there a problem with this approach? Our backend is in Java. We're writing tests in Java. Is there a problem with that? And I say there is a problem, especially if we are talking about web. When it comes to web tests, really it's about keeping the test user-centric. So in that case, because most of our front ends are written in JavaScript, I really encourage you to write your test in JavaScript. And it's something I came uh, to realization after you know, working with Web for quite some, some time. And, and really it, what it helps me to do is, when I'm an API first team, I don't even touch you know, end-to-end -end flows, end-to-end -end tests whatsoever. I have a specific test, for whatever it uses, REST Assure, or whatever framework it might be, for just the web services or whatever APIs I might have created. For the web in particular, because of the front end is written in JavaScript, I would want to write my test in JavaScript as well to again enforce that ubiquitous language. Your production team uses JavaScript to write production code, it might as well have tests in JavaScript because you don't have to have this translation or another onboarding bottleneck where you have to introduce a new person to both parts of your code. You know, we're writing client side in JavaScript, we're writing our tests and our behavioral driven tests in JavaScript as well. So basically mi minimizing those bottlenecks and the roadblocks that one might face. So even though it might look complex, uh, and uh, especially if you look at Cucumber for JavaScript, because I, I have the example for that as well. Yes. So for JavaScript, uh, Cucumber would look very similar. It's exactly the same feature files. Nothing has changed here. The same exact statements. Has some validation in the lint that tells me something is wrong. Had been said, everything is fine. <laughs> Uh, but in, in short, the same feature files and the similar bindings. But bindings, unfortunately, again, they're a bit cumbersome. You have, of course, given, when, and then clauses, the same way you have strings as an argument that's been converted. Uh, but uh, I just don't like how it looks like. Honestly, it, it takes quite a bit of uh, code and verbosity to even implement these steps in JavaScript. So as much as you can do that, I wouldn't you know, encourage you to do that with Cucumber in this particular example. That's why I, uh, I'm talking about something else today. All right, so time for something new, of course. It's gonna be uh, Gouge for the BDD uh, driver, the BDD runner overall, and then we will discuss Taiko in how it can actually empower you to write those behavioral driven tests. Okay. So let's take a look at the uh, Gouge in a bit more details. Again, it's an open source library. It's been, uh, of course, uh, released. Uh, basically, the first version, of course, was already released by ThoughtWorks. Um, there's quite a community right now and has quite a few stars on GitHub. And uh, then North also recently gave a quite a bit of props to the team as well. Uh, but in short, what Gouge actually is, is the instead of writing scenarios that you've seen in those feature files in a feature specific way in a feature dedicated files you can use just the markdown itself to write those scenarios so you basically have a it's the closest you can ever get to the nature language because really they have extremely flexible syntax there is no requirement of you following this given when and then clauses anymore you try to you now don't even have to have a discussion with your other stakeholders that okay we are using the syntax of given when, then, when we're discussing requirements and functionality. No, you don't even have to have that discussion anymore. Everything is now as natural and as simple as it gets because it's the same exact language you might use during the discussion you now have in your markdown. Um, they are, the, this framework is highly maintainable in a sense that, uh, it's, again, it's not as much of a behavioral driven tool as much as a testing tool. Because you, you might use it for collaboration, of course, but because it does not enforce those rules of giving when and then, you can potentially run it as an automation tool, especially when it's combined with Styco, and I'll show it to you uh, why it really helps with maintenance cost. Uh, and plugins and tools, as I've said, there is quite a community already existing out there. Um, and they have uh, some plugins for reporting and uh, different languages as well. So if I were to talk about the markdown and scenarios themselves, let me quickly show you how it actually looks like. All right, that's uh, one of the examples, yes. So one of the examples I might have here, yeah. So basically the same way you would write your markdown uh, where you have the, obviously the pound, then you have the name, the main title, then you specify the scenario, 
so when it can and then you basically have like the bullet point list of what the steps might look like and there is again as free of the syntax as you might want to have if it was really like the complete markdown and the way it's displayed and for display purposes i have it also in the md file and the md format it basically look like that when it's converted if you have a proper support in your IDE. In this case I'm using WebStorm but basically again it will just com completely show you how the markdown looks like in this example. So you know proper name, the bullet points for the lists and this is how it's going to be represented in the bindings and we will look at the bindings in a second when I'll do the live uh, implementation of these steps. But ultimately again it's just a markdown as simple and the natural language it gets. But for the plugins, let me show you the plugins. For the plugins themselves, I don't want to show you the plugins and tools. Again, as I've said, there are quite a few already. Uh, there are quite a few built in. Um, the CLI for Gauch is quite, I wouldn't say exhaustive, but helpful. You can easily create uh, um, language bindings right off the bat for the project you're working with. They already have runners for major languages. They have uh, IDE plugins for obviously the visual code, for the it's right here. Uh, IntelliJ and other IDEs as, as well. Uh, obviously, they encourage you to build your own if you'd like. Uh, people would obviously appreciate that an open source contribution. Reporting, they already, ah, interesting. Uh, the reporting obviously also is here as well. There is, some of it is already built in, and I'll show it to you after we run a test or so, and uh, you will see the reporting built in, but you can also use other formats. Uh, so you can integrate it with your existing um, environments, your existing infrastructure. And of course, it also takes screenshots on the failure, and we'll see it in a second. All right. So, it's all good and all, but the most com common question with Ga, which I actually get, uh, I get when I give this talk, is about, about test data retrieval. Because if you've worked with Cucumber, you probably have used things like uh, retrieving test data by the variable, or if you remember that the bracket called string, which converted to any argument you want, uh, it also accepts tables, like tables of you know, more complex Pojo kind of uh, type of data. So you have to specify a table in your uh, spec file, and it would be converted to a simple plain object in the case of Java, and you can use, use it as well. But more importantly and more conveniently, you don't have to build your own conversion of the test data from XML file uh, or Excel file as many test teams today have. Many test teams that I've seen uh, out there have like test data specified in the Excel file. They have to build the custom converters of that data uh, to be consumed by Cucumber or other BDD tools. In case of Gauch, it's already built in. You can uh, directly specify what file you want to use and consume in the Gauch tests, and it will do it for you. So they have quite a bit of things built in in comparison to other tools out there. So Taiko, though. Taiko is something that really excites me, though, because it's really about tackling UI tests. In particular, the main challenge we all face when we work with end-to-end -end scenarios, with end-to-end -end tests, is the idea of flackiness with tests. Having non-deterministic tests where it runs on your continuous integration server, it fails, you run it locally, it passes. Or it fails once, it succeeds the next time. Again, on the same server, and you like you basically spend more time fixing those tests rather than fixing the bugs or features that these tests were supposed to help you build or fix. So basically the whole purpose, it's such a waste of time dealing with those tests, those tests that flacky. And as a result, that's the main challenge when it, we deal with UI automation. So the flacky UI test, what it all comes down to is the page structure changes, especially with those fancy and cool single page application frameworks, whether it's React, Vue, Angular, whatever it might be. And more importantly is we don't know often when the page finished loading. Or in other terms, when do we start looking for a selector that we want to work with for a button we want to press? When do we start looking for it? When is the app ready um, and has been fully loaded. That's the main question we have a hard time answering when writing tests for the UI. And hence, really Taiko is trying to fix that. And of course, the, this question is kind of, a, I'm quite biased asking this question because of course, it will all lead to Taiko. <laughs> so, for Taiko, uh, it's an OJS library. So, uh, as much of the gauge is the library that may support it by multiple languages. If you want to use Taiko, it's the uh, Node.js library, so it's for JavaScript. It really helps you a lot with 
uh, things like, um, of, of course, UI automation itself. It's Chromium based. So similarly, similar pattern with all those new and fancy non-Selenium based automation frameworks like Cypress.io or Test Cafe. They've been really following this idea of let's focus on Chromium, like let's focus on Chrome, let's focus on Opera, let's focus on Brave and all those browsers that ultimately all comes down to using Chromium on the back end. Um, what it does for you, it does implicit weights the same way Cypress I.O. would have where it's uh, waiting for XHR requests to complete for the most part and some other complex logic on the back end. Uh, obviously, when you have some streaming APIs that never complete, it might pose some problems, but there are some ways to tackle it as well. Uh, and more importantly, it's all going down to these smart selectors, which I'll demonstrate in a second. What I mean by smart selectors is the idea that uh, you don't have to tackle and like search for those selectors, especially in the, the single page applications that um, really generated virtual DOM. So it's hard to find the proper selector ahead of time. Instead, it does it for you. So that idea of better maintenance or the lower cost of maintenance that Tycho and Gauch provide you is what I'm really going to try to show you today. So what I'll try to give you uh, example of Tyco in practice is the fact that Tyco has support for REPL. And I'll give you uh, a quick demo right now. All righty. So let's uh, go to my terminal. Okay. Uh, let's do Tyco. <laughs> I'll expand it in a second. So when I press, when I type Tyco, of course, I have some uh, deprecated stuff uh, at this point. That being said, uh, I started Tyco terminal, uh, the REPL. So first thing what I do is I open, uh, Jesus Christ, I open browser, which I made a mistake because it's not a function. I open the browser. It opens the Chromium for me. Uh, so let me expand it and do it one line. Let me make it a little bit larger here, a little bit larger here. Let's hide this thing. All right. So now, um, First of all, of course, we have to go to the we have to go to the URL of some sort. So we basically type go to after I'm able to actually type the simplest command ever, just go to. Let me grab the URL I want to go to. It obviously will be our to-do application. So I go to the website. So it loads the website for me. Um, gives us some feedback in the terminal directly, which is which is nice to have. Then uh, you can see that I use. Again, I really focused on this natural language, the, the language that we all can understand. I don't have to understand the programming to be able to write it or at least see and understand what this test looks like if I were to show it to a business person or domain expert that's not in the IT. So uh, when I say write, I'm basically naming my uh, to-do item. So let's say test to-do. Of course, I press enter too uh, fast. So so it, it made the focus on the, um, the pr place where it can actually write to. And you can see this is what the smart selectors are. I did not have to specify selector, uh, to do name. It just types it for me, it finds it for me. If you have a multiple um, you know, text fields and you want to kind of distinguish between the two uh, or multiple of those, there are, of course, API calls to uh, change the focus on specifically focus on the, a certain area of the application, but ultimately it makes your life easier of not writing XPath or CSS selectors or name ID and so on and so forth. So I write, it, uh, I write the name of the to-do item, that's great. Then again, I continue using the simple language. I say press enter, uh, it presses enter, it creates the to-do item, fully loaded to-do item, I can play with it. Then what I do is I use the assert a library that, again, Tyco has built in. So it has some nice assertion uh, checks. Nothing special either, but still helps quite a bit. So what I do first is I make sure that I can find to-do item by a certain text name. In our case, it's test to-do. And I want to make sure that it exists. I like how they enforce the proper grammar with exists. Um, then I say it exists, and my test passes. So that's great. So. Basically, I finished my writing my simple tests. If I wanted to just get this data and run it in an automated way in my, again, the continuous integration server or my local, the only thing I have to do is I just type that code and it generates all those steps right here for me. So nothing, you know, it kind of simplifies my process as well. If I want to dump it into the file, I'll do that code and it will save it in a uh, certain file of my choice. Um, 
and then basically I can work with that. So again, it's all good and nice. Uh, if I were to implement it in more automated way and just to show you how it works with Gouge, uh, where is my uh, Gouge example? Yeah, that's exactly it. So I have my uh, spec file. I have a couple of scenarios here specified. One is a failing example, one is a passing example. Basically a similar feature file, but in this case it's a spec file written in Markdown where I guess, again I try to create a valid item named speak at the conference. Then I uh, have a specification implementation for each of the steps. Obviously a couple of import statements, they're not important to us. I go to URL the same way you just saw it. I have, after, so there is obviously some hooks like before scenario, so it will be run before up every scenario, before suite, so it will run before the entire uh, feature file, or entire spec file. In my case, I wanted these tests to run uh, or this kind of a new state for the application for every scenario that I have in a feature file. And then I have basically those steps specified. Again, notice that there is no given when and then anymore, just called step. And the same way I just pass the uh, a type that I'm expecting as an argument and I'm working with that. So I write, I press and I validate. If I wanted to run it, again, running it as simple as uh, using Gouge and Taiko, I've, uh, I've hidden how basically Gouge has to find the specs file and runs all of them. So I basically do obviously Gouge, oh, no, I don't do Gouge, it's too much. I do instead NPM test and so what it does for me it starts trying my tests. So it basically does it for me. It's the first instance and then does the second one, uh, which would ultimately fail. And when it fails, what it does is it basically tells me, of course, in the terminal that one failed, one passed. And the best thing, again, if I want to just give a quick POC, because when you introduce a new tool, it's important to experiment with it first. You don't want to commit to a new tool right off the bat, but you also don't want to spend time setting up all the missing pieces like reporting, selectors. You don't want to spend time doing that. That's why Gauch and Taiko is a great combination because you can just get started with them easily and have a reporting built in, have a proper uh, selectors built in. Everything is already built in so you can demonstrate it to your team and hopefully get a buy-in from your, uh, you know, all the stakeholders that work with you. And if I were to go to the, see the report, I won't be fancy either and I'll just see the results. Uh, of course, this is the Gouge one with the Gouge logo because it's the building reporting. You can obviously change that. So when you go to the results, of course, it will first focus on the failed one. It takes a screenshot, in my case, of the entire desktop. But you can also limit that if you wanted to so you know where the failure happened. Uh, then it basically, uh, you can have a proper error message. Don't be like me, have a proper error message. It's uh, one of the most important aspects, of course. It tells you what step it failed on. Um, and of course, at the bottom, because nobody cares about what actually f worked, at the bottom you will have uh, passing tests. And this kind of a uh, pie chart looks very disappointing. Uh, that being said, there is some metric that already is generated for you. So it's kind of a, a good start for trying to, again, experiment with a new tool. So that's basically Gouge in the nutsh with a, a Taiko in a nutshell. All righty. Right, so the gouge and Taiko overall, um, the final piece that I wanted to focus on and I already kind of showed is again the reporting because uh, ultimately the cool thing about some of the plugins I've showed you before, you can generate it not just as HTML but you can convert it to JSON, XML and feed it into your existing infrastructure, potentially create tickets for the failures, attach the screenshots that the Taiko will, uh, gouge will take for you and basically get trolling really quickly. But again, the main question that I've kind of established and what's this whole premise for the talk is, is the should we revive PDD for web? Of course, it's arguable if it's even that in the first place, but again, the kind of question that I said, I would say it definitely worth it in more, but in, I wouldn't just say do it of the bat and do whatever the book tells you to do. More importantly is to revive it and adjust it to your uh, specific scenario. Don't just go for it out of nowhere. Respect this idea that one size fits all is a bad practice to follow. Never be dogmatic. So specifically in case of uh, Gauch and Taiko, uh, people really distinguish that aspect of it not just being the collaboration tool. So even though we say it's a BDD tool, 
it, you might go beyond just establishing the specifications by example, living documentation. You could potentially extend it, especially if you use just Tyco with your automation framework. You can just establish it as a regression suite as well. It just you really have to adjust it for your unique use case. You don't have to limit yourself just because someone said so. Really adjust it. One size does not fit all. Uh, but ultimately, try to, try to use the tool, at least initially, for a purpose it was building, or and the main purpose was improving collaboration. Get To get a buy-in and this whole concept of behavior-driven development, try to use it where it's really needed, in those meetings, in those three Amigo meetings with all the stakeholders, to get some benefit out of that. Um, and again, really have a whole team buy-in. You don't want to have just your team using Gauch and Taiko and the other team using pure Selenium for just a functional test store. You want to have a proper discussion ahead of time, or at least a discussion to let's spike on it, let's give it a try, let's experiment and see whether it works for us or, for us or not, because you want to speak the same language. As soon as you have a tool mix up where one team uses one tool, another team uses another tool, you now have to introduce Think about even onboarding process. When a new person comes in, you have to show them different uh, frameworks they have to use, even for testing alone. You want to avoid that complexity, that because it all costs money. Ultimately, it all comes down to the money you spent and the return on investment. And uh, again, don't forget that code is what we use for live documentation, for really maintaining our code base. So you know, writing Java docs and comments might be great, but they get outdated. Executed code does not get outdated as long as it's used. So if you have tests, in this case BDD tests, if they start failing, you would know something has changed. You would know that they are not up to date anymore. So if you have something running and passing, you know it's actually valid and you can refer to it. So these sort of tools can help you with that as well. Because again, you can talk through this code, and not just with your developers and testers, but also with other stakeholders as well. So. With that, I really want to leave you with a quick call for action. Uh, first is really evaluate your current state. Maybe you're already in a great position, and uh, your, uh, you know, your release plannings or feature discussions are going well, and there is no, never a misalignment on when you release your software and what you assumed or what your project manager assumed. You haven't had a disconnect. I really want to talk to you if you are in a situation like that because I've been facing those issues when I would release a software, it's not what was expected. Um, so that's of, of, often there's something we all face and we all deal with. So really take a look at what you're currently working with and whether these tools might help you with that. Uh, but more importantly, start the conversation. Uh, talk again, talk to the team or the customers or the project managers, because you might not think there is a problem, but they really have a problem. If a customer gets promised one thing, by the sales team, but you release a completely different functionality, there might be a problem you're not aware of. You want to have that conversation early on and figure out what's actually happening. That's why I always encourage people to go to user conference or user meetups to learn more about your real customers, your domain, and be able to discuss that th thing with people who actually use your software. But again, be flexible. Don't just be stuck with the old way to do things or be stuck even with the concept of behavioral driven development or just with the idea that it's tough and difficult to maintain, it doesn't worth it because you've used it once with Cucumber and now never again. Be flexible, give it a try. Things have changed, hopefully for the better, but again, you would not know until you give it a try. And the last and more important is that we as developers, I hope, still have that spark of creativity and enjoyment working with the new things. I know we all want to rebuild and recreate the wheel, but sometimes uh, what's worth of doing is trying out the new things that other people build, especially when it's open source, you kind of feel the connection with the people who work on it. So really give it a try, experiment, and I hope you will enjoy it. So with that, we'll go to Q&A, but first of all, really thank you for your time and uh, thank you for joining me here. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, please. Do you have tests? Yes, they do. I believe so. For the implement when you map the implementations, yes. Uh, sorry, the question was: Is there a TypeScript support? I said yes. <laughs> so yeah, you can run. You can run basically. You can write whatever imp implementations you want and whatever way you like. So there is no restriction in that regard. Mm. 
One thing I have to not mention, by the way, Taiko is and currently is in beta, but they're going to release the first V1 uh, early July this year. So uh, it's an exciting time. Uh, y y y yes, sorry, I'll uh, ask you first. Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. Uh, they uh, basically they they identify what framework you're working with. Basically, they figure out what the the, um, the so they basically only mostly only work with single page application for the most part because you know the static pages are very simple to work with. But they basically uh, find if you invoke a write operation, they would they find what can be written to. So basically, the text field. And it's easy when there is only one field. But if you have multiple, they have an API call to uh, have a focus on a specific area. And there, you have to give some reference. For example, if it's a placeholder text for the to-do, it has a placeholder text to-do name item. So you basically give a reference uh, to that aspect so it can focus on that and uh, type into that tech field, it can validate against that text field, and that's where it helps you to do that. But again, if you want to be very specific, you can go down to exact selectors if you wanted to. So you don't have to rely just on those smart selectors. Obviously, they get smarter as we progress. Uh, and with, with any sort of frameworks that say it's like, a, what's it called, a easy to set up or easy to get running, there's always, obviously as you scale up, there might be some complexities introduced. but. Uh, yeah, that's basically toggling the focus, and uh, you can do the selectors if you want to do more complex ones. So I don't know who was, who was first. Let, let. Okay, great. That's a, that's a good question. Thank you. Yeah, I've tried that uh, application that basically relied on Lightning Web Components, uh, where basically there would be, because that one is especially difficult, because it would, uh, lo like, different parts of the application would load in isolation, especially because, so usually it works fine even for more complex uh, applications. Where I face difficulties were, and the same goes for like Cypress IO, is when I have a streaming API of some sort running on the background. Because again, with XH, with these kind of frameworks, non selenium frameworks, the way it handles page load time, or basically this problem of flaky tests, uh, let's do the assertion when the page load finished loading, what it does, it's Let's finish till all the requests complete and nothing else happens. When you have a streaming API, it never stops. So uh, especially if you have like some feed APIs that fetches comments and things like that, that's where the complexity introduced. You can either uh, try to uh, basically um, kind of blacklist that request. You can try to do that. But also if you have something you can't control, it will ultimately time out. And you can also specify the timeout of how long the Taiko would want to wait for that um, request to go in. But if it's your application, you can also control it from the back end. For example, is this com very complex application, we have a thing called test context. As much as I don't like separate how the production looks like versus the test environment, sometimes you have to do that. So uh, on, this is the challenges that you face sometimes when you're working with uh, more complex and real life applications. Uh, but it's still doable. It's still doable, especially it looks nice <laughs> at the beginning at least. But then you're like, I don't know. Again, with any sort of tools that just on V1, there are some problems. But uh, as you use it and you build for your use cases, you can. It's a good chance to contribute to open source, which I really interested in in my career at least. So yeah, thank you for the question though. Uh, y y yes, uh, in the red. Uh, Does it support? Huh, this doesn't support the gestures. Huh, that's a good question. I'm uh, I'm not 100 percent sure about those uh, API calls. I'm, sh I'm hmm, that's a good question. I'm not sure, but they have a very nice documentation already. So if anything, I would <laughs> I would definitely recommend. Let me actually write. That's a good question. I've never thought of that because <laughs> uh, I'm not I'm not working as much in the in a mobile environment for the for these sort of applications, but. I would imagine so. Like with all these again, non senior frameworks, they follow the suit of more popular ones like Cypress.io. If Cypress.io has it and it does, uh, this this one will have as well. So I'm not surprised if they do or they will in the near future. So, but, but thank you for the question. I need to remember that. That's a good question. Yes, please. Yeah. What about Firefox and Internet Explorer? Internet Explorer. 
uh, future Microsoft Edge, of course, will be Chromium-based. That kind of helps. <laughs> the same problem goes as for the... <laughs> um, so there's no problem using Gouge with those. Taiko, though, is Chromium-based. Uh, it's the same question as for the Cypress I.O. I don't think it would be able to, at least Cypress I.O. will be able to work for the non-Chromium browsers. And the reason is that the only way they can really use it for Firefox or basically non-Chromium-based browsers is by having things like a, a plugin for the browser. That's the only way they can ever use it for the, the browsers as the tool is implemented today. So unless there is a plugin that's going to be developed by the community in the future, I don't see that happening. Um, that being said, for big enterprises, they, of course, emphasize support for different browsers, especially if you work like with things like you, you work with Asia, for example. I work with the insurance companies that still use Internet Explorer 9. I would never forget those customers. Uh, and there you obviously have to have support for those types of browsers. But for small to medium-sized companies or a new functionality that you can be developing, I see more and more companies enforce from the get-go certain browsers. You don't want to enforce not to use Firefox. Firefox is great. You should never. But of course, you would enforce against using anything before IE 11. Uh, my, my buddy even has like a timer on his desk that tracks down when the IE 11 like, would be deprecated. That being, that being said, um, I don't see that happening in the near future, support for other browsers. Because they, they, they focus on these medium to small companies that don't really emphasize support for other browsers other than Chromium based. Because still it's a king. I know Firefox is growing in popularity. Chromium is still kind of a king. I know mobile browsers have uh, different metrics in terms of statistics of usages, but Chromium is still kind of the main thing, and uh, that's what they've been focusing on. So I don't know, I don't know when exactly it will be done and if it will be done. But plugins is probably will be the only way to do, they will be able to do it. But that's, that's a good question, because that's the, what something business people will ask you <laughs> when you try to introduce it for sure. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Yes, please. Oh, like you, wait, is it like uh, you run test A, it generates test data, the test B consumes? I had exactly the same <laughs> question on the uh, other conference I spoke at. I would not recommend doing that because <laughs> you want to keep your test isolated as possible because then you get basically shoot yourself in the lack of uh, having this another dependency or non-deterministic tests now uh, to some extent get introduced because one test depends on the success of another and if another fail or, or if your test B fails because of test A, you don't really know that and you have double the failures, you could potentially do that. The way you would do it is test A finishes running and at the end generates a test file with the output that the test B consumes. You can do that. I would not recommend doing that, but you can do that. But again, because the gouge has built-in support of consuming the files, the test data from the files, you can do that. Don't recommend, though. <laughs> but you can always find a way, of course, as with anything. Uh, thank you for the question. Any other questions? Great. So please feel, uh, feel free to grab a st sticker stand. That's nice, very nice. Uh, pens and the covers for the camera. And again, give it a try. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you.